Nature isn't just out there in some far off exotic location. It's all around us, including right outside our doors. Hi, my name is Shannon Tromboli, and I am the host of Backyard Ecology. I invite you to join us as we ignite our curiosity and natural wonder, explore our yards and communities, and improve our local pollinator and wildlife habitat. Hi everyone, today we are talking with Shelby Fulton. Shelby is the terrestrial zoologist for the Office of Kentucky Nature Preserves. Hi Shelby, welcome to Backyard Ecology. Thank you for talking with us today. Yeah, thanks for having me. Oh, I'm excited. Let's start out by telling everybody a little bit about yourself and what you do, how you got started in all this. Sure. So I have lived in Kentucky since I was in ninth grade. And before that, I was living in West Virginia for quite a while. So I've, I've been in, in this region for most of my life. And I got my start in entomology actually by way of bats. So beginning in my undergraduate career, I had a research project that dealt with uh, the dietary habits of bats. And in the Eastern United States, bats eat insects and they have some interesting associations there. Um, bats prefer moths in particular because moths have a very soft body compared to something like a beetle. If you step on a beetle, it has this crunchy, hard exoskeleton. And when a bat eats, you know, a hard, crunchy insect like a beetle, it's harder to digest than a nice, soft, squishy moth. So I was doing a lot of trapping of moths on the landscape, and that led me to my love of the group as a whole. So now, professionally, a lot of what I do is go to sites that we have some involvement with in the state of Kentucky and survey for moths to try to get a handle on what the diversity is at these locations, as well as look for any um, rare or unusual species. Though I work with other groups as well. Very cool. So you were talking about rare and unusual species. Do we have many species of moths that are threatened or endangered? Well, it's actually really hard to, um, really hard to say because we have a huge amount of moths in Kentucky. We have over 2,500 documented species of moths, and we probably have a couple hundred that are undescribed or unknown to us floating around out there. So because of the sheer volume of species, it's really difficult to say which ones may be unusual, because if you set up a trap one night or you set out with a light to see what comes, you may have a hundred species, but you will likely only have two to three individuals of each one. So this makes it really hard to nail down what species may be uncommon. But there are some things we can say, there are some generalizations we can make. So many moths will, um, their caterpillars will feed on any type of plant. Some are very specific though, and they will only feed on one or several types of plants. And if a moth is associated with a rare plant, then it's, it stands to reason that the moth would also be rare. We also consider to be rather rare moths that are associated with unusual or rare types of habitats. So historically, Kentucky had large areas of barrens and prairie habitats, and those have disappeared in the modern era for the most part. So moths that rely on these barrens or um, prairie remnant habitats are probably quite rare as well. And I would assume that's probably a pretty good assumption over most of the eastern U.S. as we're starting to learn, especially the southeastern U.S., as we're starting to learn that there was a lot more grasslands there than we thought there were. Yeah, I think that's a, a very safe assumption to make. Yeah, and I mean, I've always known that there were more moths than butterflies as far as number of species, but I never realized how many more moths there were until we were emailing back and forth and you were talking about 2,500 different species at least in mm -hmm. Kentucky alone. Absolutely. And many of these species are very, very tiny. So uh, less than five millimeters long, very teeny tiny moths that, you know, you can't see them with the naked eye hardly, let alone identify them that way. So uh, these species lists rely a lot on collectors who are able to do dissections to get a species specific identifications and also genetic work where it's applicable is also useful in boosting those numbers. 
Well, there's a lot of different angles, obviously, that we could take with having this discussion about moths. I mean, from learning about the different individuals to their associations with some of these plants or habitats that you're talking about. But let's kind of focus on moths during the winter. And I'm going to admit, I know the basic broad answers, but I don't know the details. And a lot of people that I've talked to don't know the details. In fact, the reason I wanted to have you on here is because I have gotten so many questions recently about moths and wanting to learn more about moths and also wanting to know more about the moths in the winter. So yeah, that's kind of where I want to focus on. And I'm really excited about getting to learn more as well myself with this. So how do moths spend the winter? What do they do? So this varies a lot by species. Most species of moths will suspend development in the winter. They'll suspend their life processes in some sort of sheltered microhabitat, but they can do this at any life stage, depending on the species. So some species will spend the winter as an egg in suspended development. Some will spend the winter as a caterpillar. A great example of this is um, the woolly bear that everyone is familiar with. They're very commonly seen throughout the winter. Or woolly worms, because it's some people know it by one, some does. It's a exactly. regional thing. Um, some species, many species, probably most, spend the winter as a pupa, and they're just waiting for warmer temperatures to emerge. But we do also have moths, and even one butterfly that I know of in our state that spends the winter as an adult. And as an adult, they can either be dormant, so in that state of arrested development, or some are active throughout the winter and they will fly around, they'll look for mates, they'll feed, etc. So what are they feeding on in the winter? Because there's not a lot of flowers blooming out there. Right. This hasn't been studied for most species that are active in the winter, but they are documented as coming to man-made sugar-based baits. So it's likely that a, a dominant food source for them throughout the winter is tree sap. Um, that could be a key nutritional resource. I'm thinking possibly, and this is just not knowing anything, possibly fermented fruit that's left over? Certainly. That is a key component of most uh, sugar baits. So a typical sugar bait will have some sort of rotting or fermenting fruit. I like to use bananas because they give it a thicker texture that helps the bait stay on trees. To that, you add some sort of sugar, whether it's actual sugar or molasses. I've used maple syrup before. So any kind of sugar and then some sort of alcohol. People have their own preferences. I tend to find that it doesn't matter. So I've heard some people swear by specific kinds of rum. And every moth or butterfly person has their own special bait recipe that they swear by. So there is no singular tried and true but it's something to experiment with, experiment with your quantities, see what works. Okay. So when you're talking about the adults being active and everything, what triggers that activity? It's typically going to be associated with temperature. And when we talk about the active adult period of a moth's life cycle, which we term their flight period, we do also need to be mindful of geography. So a moth that's really widely distributed across the eastern United States might not fly until spring in Michigan, say, but it might fly in late winter in Alabama, where it's much warmer. So winter doesn't mean the same thing, uh, depending on where you are. So my perspective is very Kentucky focused. When I say winter, I'm usually talking about December, January, February. Uh, but certainly winter moths are active even here in November as well. So be mindful of our geographic bias. But yes, temperature is generally the trigger. I would say temperature is the key determinant for winter moth activity. The moths that are active throughout the winter have physiological adaptations that allow them to withstand winter temperatures that other moths may not be able to survive. And yet, even these moths do have a lower temperature threshold and an upper threshold, actually. If it gets too warm, they experience heat mortality. But for these moths as well, they're triggered by very cold temperatures. And this is a very physiological trigger because if they are too cold, they're unable to generate the warmth they need in their thorax. So that central region of the body 
that they need that heat to actually beat their wings and fly. And these moths do exhibit shivering behaviors. Many moths do. A key physiological feature of these winter moths that fly is that they start shivering at even colder temperatures. So there seems to be a lower limit on the temperature at which a moth can actually begin shivering. So that environmental trigger of, hey, it's too cold to shiver, it's too cold to generate this heat in the body, um, indicates that they need to make a behavioral shift to seek out a more protected microhabitat. And for our winter moths, that's usually going to be in the leaf litter. And that's where many of our caterpillars and the cocoons, the pupa, are overwintering as well, correct? Yes, that is correct. It's typically warm enough to be sustainable, and it provides some shelter as well from predators throughout the winter, namely birds. Yeah, and that's one of the things when people ask me about providing habitat for moths or butterflies or lots of other things during the winter. I'm always like, leave the leaves. Just don't rake the leaves if you can help it because that's, that is important habitat for so many of these animals. Absolutely. I would say it's very important for pollinators as, a, as an entire group. And kind of curious about this, because with your physiology and having that shivering behavior that we were talking about, so what's happening with the moths when it is too cold? Do they just seek out the other behaviors and then they're just kind of active, or do they basically go into a moth version of hibernation. I mean, you and I as biologists know it's not true hibernation, but kind of the equivalent of. That's an interesting question that I don't entirely have the answer for. My assumption would be that they attempt to seek out these protected, insulated microclimates and there remain dormant until there's a second environmental trigger that temperatures are warm enough that they can begin their shivering behaviors. Uh, that is just an assumption though. Yeah, there's so much to learn with science. I mean, that's, I don't know about you, but that's one of the things that attracts me to it and that I love is because we're always learning and there's always something else to discover. Definitely. So with the moths, um, especially the ones that are active during the winter months or kind of active during the winter months, depending on how you want to look at this, with butterflies, I know we have several species that migrate to warmer climates during the winter. So they're active in the warmer climates. They just don't, they're not present in Kentucky or other states. I mean, this is true throughout the, South, um, the eastern U.S. But do we have any migratory moths? Not that I know of. And I don't know if that's because we don't have migratory moths or because no one has looked into it. I do know that we frequently in the summer get accidentals from further south, from significantly further south, uh, and those would not be considered migratory because it's uh, not, not um, a defined part of their life history, but we do get accidentals and moths like butterflies can also be dispersed by extreme wind and weather events. So we do end up with oddities, but I'm not aware of any legitimate migrations. Yeah. That's when that's kind of what I thought the answer would be, but it's just one of those when I was preparing for our talk, all of a sudden it popped into my head, probably because I was watching all the sulfur butterflies go through. And I know they're migrating right now or were migrating. But yeah, so do moths do that? I in quick Google search I didn't see anything. So that's why I was like, let me ask Shelby. So if we're trying to provide this habitat for moths during the winter, is there anything that we can do besides just leaving the leaves? Or is that pretty much like the major thing? Leaving the leaves is the best thing you can do to support winter moths. Other than that, the only thing that would occur to me would be more for your own personal interest rather than uh, for any sort of conservation effort, but if you are interested in personally seeing some of these moths, I would recommend mixing up some sugar bait. And uh, you can paint it on the sides of tree trunks on a warm winter evening and see what turns up, you might get lucky. But I don't think that an individual would be able to uh, do that in a large enough effort to make a significant difference to feeding the population. Uh, 
Uh, and I'm not sure I would recommend that even if it was possible. Yeah, that would, that would be really cool for just observing because it is so much fun to see what all is out there. Um, would you need any sort of a light source on that or just the sugar bait? No, uh, studies that I have looked at have shown an association with sugar bait. I have not seen any mention of using UV light uh, in the winter. It's possible that these species are not attracted to light or it may just be that because food is such a limiting resource for them in the winter that uh, providing them with a food source is going to be so much stronger as an attractant that a UV light source isn't necessary. But it does seem that uh, using sugar bait is the best way to get this particular group of species. And are there specific species that you can tell us about anything about? Well, there is one particular genus that is usually what I have in mind when I talk about winter moths. Really, there's what's called a, a tribe. And a tribe is a smaller unit of a subfamily, which is a smaller unit of a family, which is a smaller unit of Lepidoptera, which means butterflies and moths. So we're just, you know, when I say a tribe of moths, I'm talking about a specific taxonomic unit. And the tribe that I associate with winter flight activity is called the Xylanini, and it is in the family Noctuidae. Within the Xylanini, one of the most commonly discussed genera of winter moths is the genus Lithophany. Lithophany are often active exclusively in late fall through the winter, and they have some really interesting physiological adaptations, as well as a few other members of the tribe that allow them to withstand winter temperatures. So I already mentioned that they are able to begin shivering at colder temperatures than moths that fly in a warmer part of the year. These xylanini and lithophany moths also have fluff on the thorax, that central body segment, and that's where the wings are attached. So that's the really important body segment to maintain heat in. So that fluff on the thorax is a really great adaptation. And I don't know how in the weeds with this we want to get, but at least some species in this group have a form of countercurrent heat exchange in their circulatory system. So insects have an open circulatory system, so they don't have arteries and veins. Instead, the blood, which is called hemolymph in insects, flows freely in the body cavities. The main structural component of the circulatory system is a single vessel, and we call it the heart in the abdomen, and we call it the aorta in the thorax. So these are two distinct things, whereas in a human, the aorta is a component of the heart. Right. So blood, the hemolymph, enters the heart in the abdomen, and it flows up into the thorax, into the aorta. And in these winter moths, there are hairpin curves in the circulatory system. And so the blood on each side of the hairpin curve warms each other. So one side warms the other side. So they exchange heat between each other, and that reduces the temperature gradient, and that helps keep the temperature stable. If they didn't have this countercurrent heat exchange, the cool blood flowing through the aorta would actually steal heat that was being generated by muscle contractions. So the muscle contractions in the thorax would generate heat, but all of that heat would be used up trying to keep the blood warm. But the system is self-sustaining in that it allows the blood to keep itself warm. So that heat generated by muscle contractions can go towards flight instead. Interesting. Yeah, it's always amazing all the different adaptations and how complex they can get that different organisms have. Yeah. Can you give us some examples of some of the species that might overwinter as a pupa or a cocoon? Sure. Um, it's, it's the majority of our species. So. Um, What's coming to mind right now is the family of moths known as the prominence, which is the family Nododonidae. There's an extremely common moth in this family called Nodata gibosa that most likely uses this strategy. But the majority of our moth species do overwinter as a pupa. Typically, I encounter pupa while I'm doing snail surveys. So um, when you're identifying snails, for various reasons, it's much easier to identify an empty snail shell than a live snail. So one thing I do a lot of in the winter is digging through leaf litter piles to look for snail shells. And I very commonly turn up moth pupa that are spending the winter there. 
And sometimes I do take them back to the lab with me and keep them in a little container and wait to see what comes out in the spring. And I'm assuming that you're keeping them outside so they'll have the natural conditions and not bringing them inside because if it's temperature dependent, wouldn't that kind of spur them into early development? I keep them inside because typically I am not releasing them back into the wild. Okay. So it doesn't matter if they go through. Right, right. I'm not too concerned about uh, shifting their ecology typically. Okay. All right. And if other people wanted to learn more about moths in the winter, where would you suggest that they go to do that? Probably the Xerces Society might have some links to it or, or is there anything? If someone was interested in learning more about how butterflies and moths spend the winter, the Xerxes Society for Insect Conservation is a great resource for these sorts of questions in general. The information they have available on moths and butterflies in the winter is primarily focused around migrations of butterflies and the preservation of leaf litter on the landscape throughout the winter as a means of habitat protection. There is not going to be specific information about what species are active throughout the winter. That information is a little harder to come by. Yeah, I tried some Google Scholar searches on it and pretty much came up empty, except for a invasive species that's known as the winter moth is the common name, and I forget what the scientific is. I believe you're talking about Ophiroptera bruniata. Sounds about right. But there are actually two non-native moths in our region that are called the winter moth. Oh, interesting. So that's one interesting. is that Ophiroptera bruniata, and that is not found in Kentucky. It's established particularly in the Northeast, although it is also found in the Pacific Northwest, but I don't think it's quite as established there as it is in the Northeast. There's a second species called, I believe, Aranus tiliaria that is also known sometimes as the linden looper, and that is found in Kentucky. I'm not overly familiar with either species. Most of the species, well, all of the species that I mentioned as being in that tribe Xylanini and in the genus Lithophony, to my knowledge, those are all native. Okay. Now there is another set of moths that are active in the winter by a completely different strategy, and more of these are non-native. And these are pest species. So because temperature is such an important determinant of when moths are active, the cold in the winter causes most species to be dormant but species that have a strong association with humans and with human dwellings don't experience cold in the same way that more wild species do because our homes are very temperature controlled and they are typically warm all winter long. So these pest species whose larvae are usually found in stored grains and things like that, they complete their life cycle year round, just generation after generation all year around. And we do have native species of pest moths indoors, but there are also non-native species there. That makes sense. Um, when we were emailing back and forth, you mentioned another moth that I thought was really interesting. The herald? Yes, the herald. Latin name is Scolioptrix libatrix. It's a very attractive moth, reddish, with some really interesting markings. This moth is dormant in the winter as an adult, but what makes it so cool is it spends the winter on the inside of caves. They will perch on the ceilings of caves or high up on the walls, and they will move a few millimeters throughout the winter, if at all. And they can sometimes be quite abundant in caves. And so depending on your interest in caves and how much time you spend in them, you may or may not encounter these pretty regularly in the winter. I have also seen reports that they will sometimes use cellars and barns and things like that, but I've never seen that myself. I have only seen this species in caves. And is this a species that's only found in Kentucky or does it have a broader range? No, it's got a, a larger range. I'm not sure of the exact distribution, but I would imagine it's found throughout the Eastern United States. Okay, and is it like, does it like certain caves more than others? Because like, I mean, you know, because we met there, but for about 12 years, I was a contractor at Mammoth Cave National Park. And so I've been in and out of caves quite a bit, but I don't remember ever seeing it. And I'm just curious, are there certain types of caves that it likes or was I just not noticing it? 
because that it could go either way. Yeah. So I found one paper that looked at some habitat characteristics of caves that these moths were found in. And I don't remember uh, exactly what their conclusions were, but I believe it was related to humidity. Which makes sense. A lot of cave species, especially the insects, are humidity dependent as one of the characteristics for where they actually locate in and the caves that they choose. Is there anything else that you'd like to share with us? One question you had asked while we were emailing is what the ecological role of yeah. these winter moths are. And I would say that their main role in the environment is the same as it is in the summer. They are a great source of winter food for birds in particular throughout the winter, um, possibly small omnivorous creatures. I assume a raccoon would happily chow down on a moth if it could grab one. Now in the summer, they're an extremely important food source for bats. In the winter, of course, most of our bat species are uh, in torpor, uh, hibernation in caves or in tree cavities. And evidence shows that although they do sometimes awake in the winter, uh, they tend not to eat. But we do have a few species of bats that have been documented to eat in the winter, um, particularly the eastern red bat. Although this is a migratory species, so depending on your location, they may not be around for you in the winter. But moths would be a food source in the winter, just as they are in the summer for any bats that are on the landscape. In the summer, another reason that moths and insects in general are so significant to the environment is the sheer amount of biomass they represent in the environment. So when you look at the, uh, you could talk about it in any number of ways, but if you wanted to look at the weight of animals on the landscape or the, uh, just the volume, um, insects make up an extremely large proportion of life that is out there on the landscape. And so this would not be as significant in the winter, although I'm not aware of any studies that have specifically looked at winter biomass coming from insects. You had also asked what these moths look like if they were um, particularly flashy or if they were more drab. And I have to report that they do tend to be rather drab. Uh, they are typically quite small, although not what we call micro moths. So they are a type of macro moth, uh, which you can interpret as you don't need a macro lens on your camera to look at them. You don't need a hand lens. You can just see them. So dime-sized or larger or even smaller than that? Uh, I would say dime to nickel-sized is probably a good estimate. They tend to be shades of gray and brown. They're usually narrowly triangular. And um, like I mentioned when I was talking about physical adaptations, they tend to have a lot of fluff around the thorax. They can have interesting patterns, particularly uh, dashed patterns, black dashes on the wings. And these sorts of patterns can be really important for identification purposes. But uh, typically, they are not as flashy as some of the other members of our moth assemblage that you may see in summer. Which even then, I mean, many of our summer moths kind of fall into that drab, brown, gray moth category. <laughs> Exactly. Although, although we do have some very flashy moths oh, yes. out there, of course. Everyone's familiar with the big pretty lunas mm -hmm. uh, and things like that. But people are often surprised that we have very teeny tiny moths that, that can be quite attractive. So some of those that are only five millimeters or less in size can actually be stunning colors and patterns. Ooh. It's a whole new world. Oh, yeah. <laughs> Might have to have you on some other time to talk about some of those smaller ones as well. Yeah. Some of those because it's always fun to learn new things. Definitely. This has been really interesting and educational. So thanks for coming on today. If people have questions, how would you suggest they contact you? If you have questions about winter moths or moths and butterflies in general or anything else that you think I might be able to help you out with, feel free to send me an email. Um, I know Shannon will post my email address for you, but it is shelby.fulton at ky.gov. So feel free to reach out. If you're in Kentucky and you see a moth in the winter, 
feel free to take a photo of it and send it to me as well, or you can post it on iNaturalist. But I do frequently check the Kentucky moth postings on iNaturalist to provide any ID help people might need. Okay, thanks a lot. Yeah, I will definitely have your email and some of the other links, the show notes, as well as a picture of that Harold that you were talking about, because it is a really pretty reddish brown chestnut colored moth. And that moth, that individual that's photographed, that I photographed, I observed in February, fairly close to the entrance of a limestone cave. And there were maybe eight to 10 of them in the cave, but certainly you can find many more in some locations. Very interesting. Okay, well, thanks so much for coming on today and have a great day. You too, thanks again for having me. Thanks, bye-bye. I appreciate Shelby taking the time to talk with us. I was really surprised to find out just how many different species of moss there are. And it never ceases to amaze me how many different adaptations animals have evolved to survive in challenging conditions. I definitely think I'll be making up a batch of sugar bait this winter to see who I can attract on some of our warm winter days. If you do the same, then please let me know who you find. It's always fun to see and hear about other people's backyard adventures and discoveries. Before I wrap this up, I wanted to let you know about my email list. Every week I send a short email with links to the most recent Backyard Ecology articles and episodes, as well as any other news of interest. It's the best way to make sure that you never miss anything in the Backyard Ecology world. If you haven't signed up, then I encourage you to do so at www.backyardecology.net slash subscribe. Until next week, I encourage you to take some time to enjoy the nature in your own yard and community.